Welcome to Canada's most irreverent talk show. This is The Andrew Lawton Show, brought to you by True North. Coming up, a blow against healthcare choice in Canada, Hollywood's misguided priorities, and a crackdown on internet free speech is coming. The Andrew Lawton Show starts right now. Welcome to The Andrew Lawton Show, Canada's most irreverent talk show here on True North. Going to have a busy show today with all that's happened this week, so I want to get right into the thick of things here. Yesterday, the British Columbia Supreme Court ruled on the Camby Surgical Center's case. This is a case of a private surgical clinic led by Dr. Brian Day in Vancouver that has had 10 years of litigation going, actually I think 11 now, against the BC government protesting the bans and restrictions restrictions that the BC government has on private healthcare providers like the Canby Clinic. And Dr. Day has basically argued that when you have massive wait lists, patients unable to access healthcare, and these surgical centers and surgeons that are able and willing to help them, it's a violation of those patients' right to the security of the person for the government to do things to say, no, 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 you can't operate, you can't provide these treatments for money. Of course, the activists don't like it because they want to preserve and cling to this idea of a universal healthcare system, which, well, Noble, is not working for a lot of Canadians and for some of the patient plaintiffs that were in this case. But, of course, the ruling handed down came against Dr. Day and the clinic and the patients and basically defended this idea that we must at all costs preserve and protect the universal health care system, even flying in the face of the facts of the case, which say that these patients' rights are being deprived. And we'll talk about that right now with Joanna Barron, who is the executive director of the Canadian Constitution Foundation. Joanna, thank you so much for coming on today. Really great to speak with you. Good to be here with you, Andrew. Now, I know that this was not the decision that you had anticipated, or should I say hoped for, certainly not the one I had hoped for. Just for context, the CCF wasn't an intervener in the main trial, correct? No, we're supporting the, lit- the litigation. So we're supporting Dr. Day and the Canby Surgery Center with assisting fundraising communications because we really believe that the outcome of this case, um, which is not final, uh, and what I'm sure we'll get to that in a moment, has repercussions for all Canadians and more specifically the government's actions in B.C., represent a violation of the charter rights which are enjoyed by all Canadians. So that's our interest in this case is the constitutional rights and violations. And I think that's a great place to start off here. Now, I haven't read through all 800 and some odd pages of it, but I've read through a lot of the key points of the decision. And before the decision was released, my thought was that really at stake was whether the rights of patients who are stuck on wait lists, who aren't able to access care in the public system, whether their rights are violated by all of the restrictions on private health care. And I was quite shocked actually reading through the decision to see that the court accepted that the court actually accepted that their rights are violated but ultimately said that wasn't enough to say that these bans should be found unconstitutional explain that for me yeah so as you mentioned the decision is 880 pages so we're still digesting it but the really nub of the of the important finding was that as you mentioned there were multiple findings of fact made that the patient plaintiffs one of which is deceased, one of which is permanently paralyzed, one of which was a competitive soccer player. And because she didn't receive knee surgery in time, she was deprived of her uh, college soccer scholarship. So, of course, the judge couldn't but find that there was there was a violation of their rights. However, he found that the the violation effectuated was not arbitrary or overbroad. And I find that to be a very difficult needle to thread, especially in life of and so the charter right that we're speaking about here is section seven the right to life liberty and security of the person previously the supreme court of canada has found that state actions such as preventing prostitutes from running body houses or hiring security um, preventing terminally ill or debilitating ill people from seeking physician assisted suicides as well as preventing drug addicts from seeking safe injection sites All of those government actions were found to be arbitrary and unjustified violations of Section 7. The fact that 30,000 British Columbians each year suffer on waiting lists that exceed the government's own targets 
do not meet that threshold, frankly, should shock the conscience of all Canadians. It really seemed like the court was defending this idea of the public health care system in spite of the facts of what that system's effect is on a lot of people. And I, I don't know if I'm reading perhaps an ideological component into this that isn't necessarily there, but especially when I was looking at uh, one of the concluding remarks in it, and I'll pull up the exact quote here from it, it's that the court found that, quote, preserving and ensuring the sustainability of the universal public health care system, unquote quote, uh, really trumps those rights deprivations that we're talking about here. So am I reading into that correctly, that they're saying that protecting this idea of the healthcare system matters more than really dealing with the individual cases that were put before the court? Yeah, absolutely. And I was particularly shocked by um, the juxtaposition of the minimization of the harms to the individual plaintiffs and individuals and the deference to government public health objectives. And I would note that the government did not present any compelling evidence that allowing a private safety safety release valve would have any deleterious effects on the public health care system. These private clinics, in fact, have been operating in British Columbia for the last 20 years and have only been prevented by government fines and enforcement orders in the last few years. So in fact, in BC itself, there's no evidence that there has been any effect, any deleterious effect. If, if anything, logic would suggest that if you have fewer people, um, if you have certain people that are opting out of the public system, that would almost certainly free up time. So I agree that um, there seems to be an ideological unquestioning deference to government objectives. And just to go back to sort of Law School 101 or Charter 101, the Charter is designed to, to give individuals rights against the government. So to see it turned around and used as a sort of complex, multi-layered apparatus to give government escape valves to defend arbitrary actions is simply unacceptable. And that's why we're looking forward to appealing this decision on an expedited basis. To go back to that word arbitrary, so, you know, basically what the court is saying here is that you could deprive rights, assuming it's not arbitrary, excessively broad, or, or grossly disproportionate, I think, are the three parts of that test here. How clearly defined is arbitrary in the jurisprudence? It's extremely subjective, and even our Supreme Court of Canada, which is not known for its clarity, specifically in its last Section 7 decision, decision acknowledged how much ambiguity there was around it and how subjective it could be. However, here we think it's very clear that where there is a voluminous evidence of harm and regular harm and systemic harm that we know is happening year over year, and only theoretical and in fact not borne out by real life experience either in the very jurisdiction BC or in every country in the world besides Canada that allows private surgeries um, that it's shocking that the, the judge found the subterfuge to hide in. So it's, it's quite poorly defined but I mentioned the three major section seven cases the Bedford, Carter and Insight and all of those would lead to a different result than the one we saw in this case. So we feel quite strongly about our, our appeal. So this is going to the Supreme Court, and, and I think it's probably a, a pretty good bet the Supreme Court picks it up, given there's this case and, and also the Chayuli case in, in Quebec in 2005, which I, I had to ask about here, because it, it seems like there was quite a lot of uh, twisting to try to say that the Chayuli case didn't apply, and, and that was obviously a, a case that... I think on very similar circumstances found that the, these sorts of prohibitions in Quebec specifically were not valid. And, and that was not something that expanded nationally. And I, I know that Dr. Day and, and the Canby Clinic ha, had recognized that in, in their arguments, but it did seem like there was really, I, I think, an excessive uh, interpretation of, of that in this decision that, oh, no, no, that doesn't apply, totally different circumstances. And they were even saying that the state of healthcare in Quebec in 2005 is different than British Columbia healthcare of 2020, so you can't necessarily uh, take the ruling in that case. But I don't necessarily buy into that. No, absolutely not. And, you know, I think whenever you read, or uh, as, as, as a lawyer, I know whenever I start trying to spin reasoning that, you know, a five-year-old wouldn't understand at all, there's a problem with the reasoning. Here's the nub of Chauli. 
Access to a waiting list is not access to health care. When the government takes actions to prevent people from taking their health into their own hand, it is unconstitutional. That is, you know, the main takeaway from Chauli and any attempt to, you know, shrink away from that. Although I also would mention, and this is heartening to us, that Chauli also lost at the trial court as well as the Quebec Court of Appeal. That also was a case that, you know, people were skeptical of and the Supreme Court of Canada clarified it. Um, but I agree. I didn't think any of the attempts to distinguish Chauli were compelling in the least. So what would you say are, are the big errors or aspects that you think were, were at their core wrong here? I, I mean, do you think it all comes down to the meaning of arbitrary or were there other key aspects of this decision that you think are really the strongest points of argument going into a, a Supreme Court appeal? Well, I think, first of all, there's a sort of gross misapprehension of the evidence. On the one hand, minimizing the evidence of the suffering occasioned to people who face excessive waiting times and don't have any other option. There, yeah, and, and just to, to interrupt there for a moment, there was no dispute whatsoever of the facts that these people have suffered directly as a result of the public system, correct? Correct, correct. There's just a question of if that suffering occasioned by the provisions of the BC Medicare Protection Act was arbitrary. So I think certainly the application, there's a question about the Section 7 life, liberty and security of the person and the application of the overbreadth and arbitrary test. Um, and I think also there was a gross misapprehension or a mischaracterization of the evidence that the government intimated that allowing access to private surgeries would occasion harm and that there was a clear connection between these provisions that were put into question and the protection of the public health care system, um, that again, that connection was not made out by the evidence. And of course, I would note um, our final appeal strategy is very much not settled, but on sort of first take, those are the things that stand out most to me as most egregious. I know that when I look at, and I, and I don't want to pull you out of the legal argument here, but I hope you'll bear with me for a moment, looking at just some of the reaction on Twitter, a lot of the people are, are celebrating this ruling just because, to go back to that sort of philosophical underpinning of protecting the universal healthcare system, there seems to be this fear that if this case were to have gone a different direction, that it would have just been the dismantling of, of universal healthcare in Canada. And I don't really see how that's the case because there was nothing in this that was trying to take away from the universal system or the public system if anything it was just trying to add to it and say listen when there are people that want to go to a, a private alternative they should have the right to do that and, and this isn't you know big pharma that's suffering here it's individual patients that have fallen between the cracks of this supposedly universal system yeah i mean there's so much to say about this um, it's sort of a dogma among certain people, but there's so many myths. And I think one of the main myths is that people fear that if we allow a private option, it's going to lead the Amer to the Americanization of Canadian healthcare. When America and Canada are both outliers, America is the only OECD country that does not provide public care to its citizens, and Canada is the only country that does not provide a private option. So to look more at our OECD allies like France and the UK for a more re realistic idea of what it would look like, which is about 10% in the private system. Um, and there's also, you know, fear mongering about uh, physicians being lured into the private system. And I understand why, because I didn't quite understand this until I got involved in this case, that in fact, physicians are, are rationed operating room and scheduling according to the government budget. So some of them don't have enough operating time to make a living and in some cases not even to fulfill their professional requirements. Um, so it's not a question of parceling out uh, or of luring public physicians into the private system. It's rather an option. It's rather an option of responding to the needs of, of the citizens. Yeah, and that point you just raised there was part of why this uh, particular surgical center was founded in the first place, because you had all of these surgeons that had time on their hands and, and no operating rooms in, in which they could work with that time. And, and that problem has not really gone away. I think certainly there have been changes in the last, I think, 24 years since the clinic opened, but, but a lot of those core problems are still there. That's right. That's right. And actually, the biggest user of Canby Surgery Centers is WorkSafe 
BC, which is the workers union. So there's also uh, arguably, we didn't really talk about the equality argument section 15, but there's arguably when you have a huge part of the population being allowed to access this care because they're part of a workers union, but people who don't have the benefit of extended employer insurance, not being able to access it, there's a question of equality as well. Well, since you did bring it up, let's go into what that argument was. Well, the argument was simply that we know that I think about two thirds of Canadians are covered by extended health care insurance. Uh, people are covered by BC's auto insurance policy as well as work safe policy. So there's there's you know a substantial chunk of the population that has access to private care one way or the other. Um, and people, unfortunately, who need, who need it or are being deprived of it are being discriminated against arbitrarily. So let's talk about the, the forecast here, because this is going to go to the Supreme Court. I, I don't know how much other, uh, you know, argue, how many other arguments there are beyond the ones that were put in, because this is a, a pretty extensive ruling. But do you think that there will be something gleaned from the Chiuli case at the Supreme Court level? Or do you think that is going to continue to be dismissed and discounted as it was in this decision? I think the Supreme Court of Canada's Section 7 jurisprudence, and of course there's Chowley, but it leads directly into its sort of landmark trio on Section 7 that I, I've mentioned a few times. I think it's a very robust uh, line of jurisprudence. And as the Supreme Court of Canada is bound by horizontal stare decisis, bound by its own decisions, um, it will see that there is a clear legal error here. And, and since it's a legal error, um, they are subjected to a correctness review, meaning it's owed less deference. So if they find that their own previous decision of 2005 was misinterpreted or misapplied, they can really stand up for their own precedent then? That's correct, yeah. Otherwise, they would have to overrule not just one case, but four cases that have become sort of landmark to the, to the court. Well, I think if anything, I've learned to never be too optimistic about these things. And I, I know certainly the Camo case of the uh, uh, the beer purchase across provincial borders uh, that your uh, organization fought was one as well, where optimism ended up being misplaced. But but it does sound like there's a, a strong basis here. So again, not uh, the end of the world, although it is certainly disappointing when you want to stand up for uh, the right of, of patients and, and of all Canadians. So I appreciate you taking some time to shine the light on this. Joanna Barron, Executive Director of the Canadian Constitution Foundation. Thank you. Thanks, Andrew. You know, it's hard to talk about Supreme Court decisions or BC Supreme Court decisions without feeling like you're getting a little bit too bogged down in the details. But I always get very annoyed when the media will really misrepresent what a case was about and, and misrepresent by extension what a, a decision was about. So that's why I wanted to make that segment uh, with a, an interview of someone who's actually been involved in this, someone who's actually a lawyer. I just sometimes play one when I'm covering cases, but I'm not actually a, a lawyer by any stretch. So I'm glad Joanna was able to come on. And, and you know, it's so difficult because in, in so many cases, this is where my absolutist libertarian streak comes in. The question is, should I as an individual have the right to do whatever the heck I want when it comes to my health care? And that shouldn't take 800 pages to explain at all. It certainly shouldn't take 800 pages to explain no. And I almost feel like the longer the decision, the more proof it is that they're desperately trying to justify something that fundamentally does not make sense. And that's what Joanna said that I thought was very valid about how the second you start hearing things that a five-year-old couldn't understand, you, you've tended to go in the wrong direction here. Ultimately speaking, access to a waiting list is not access to health care. And if the government is to provide something and provide a monopoly on it, they have a moral and a legal imperative to provide it well. So if the government says we are the monopoly of, on health care, we are the only ones that you can get health care from, you better damn well provide the health care, which for so many people on waiting lists, they simply are not doing. We've got to take a break. When we return, more of The Andrew Lawton Show here on True North. You're tuned in to The Andrew Lawton Show.
Welcome back to The Andrew Lawton Show. A few weeks ago, there was a controversy that put Netflix in the crosshairs of the social media world over the marketing campaign of a French movie that Netflix had picked up called Cuties. You remember the poster? I, I'm almost certain it was very memorable. It was three or four girls, uh, young girls, children in provocative attire on some dance stage. And the description for the show that Netflix put out is that, you know, an 11-year-old becomes fast fascinated with twerking and then decides to explore her femininity or something to that effect. So this was very much promoting, even if the movie hadn't been released yet, this idea that this was going to be about some child embracing her inner girl or inner woman on some dance stage twerking. And if you look at the pro the promos that have come out, the clips from the video, you see girls grabbing their crotches, dancing. We're not going to show the video because I, I don't want to promote this. But ultimately, this is what's happening. And this is what the movie has as a key feature of it. Now, understandably, people have been fairly upset about this. People have been registering their discontent with Netflix. Some people have been boycotting Netflix, canceling their subscriptions, and doing all sorts of other things. Netflix, so far, has been unrepentant about this. They stand, they're standing by it. They say that this is actually a commentary, a social commentary, against the sexualization of young children. But what's worse is that anyone who's criticizing this is now being accused of essentially just stoking some conspiracy. There was one story in The New Yorker, Cuties, the extraordinary Netflix debut that became the target of a right-wing campaign, blaming the right for saying, hey, you know, maybe we don't want to promote children in scantily clad attire grabbing their crotches as they explore their inner femininity. Now, I'm going to be honest to say I have not seen it and I have no interest in seeing it, so I'm not going to be commenting on it as though I have. I'm going to be commenting on the marketing campaign around around it, which even people who like the movie seem to think Netflix botched. My concern is with Netflix. If the movie is not actually about this, and this is the, the subject of the New Yorker piece, they say, oh, no, 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 it's actually about resisting that. It's about a girl that resists the patriarchy and all of that. But resisting the patriarchy is done by provocative dancing. So I'm not sure how that actually helps the point that this movie is not normalizing the very thing that Netflix is pretending it's combating. And moreover, the fact that when Netflix had this, it was a French film that Netflix adapted, and I don't know if it's dubbed or subtitled, but the fact that Netflix had this and they say, hmm, how can we best market this to our audience? And they sat around the boardroom table, they put up some posters, and what they settled on was the poster that I talked about earlier of the girls on the cover in their dance attire showing their midriffs and doing all that. And I'm not one of these pearl clutchers, okay? I'm not one of these people that thinks everything is supposed to be a moral panic. But I don't think having some basic morality and decency when we're talking about entertainment, even if you believe, as I believe, in a fairly absolutist view of free speech, I don't believe this is conducive to growing all of the things we want to grow in society. And when it is normalizing pedophilia, as the charge is put towards it, I don't even think you have to go that far, but you can just say it's creepy. You can say it's creepy and not be off base on that. And I remember a few years ago, I'll tell you a story, and this was something with the backlash I got I didn't understand and still don't. But I worked in a downtown office building that was connected to a few hotels. And there was one particular day where I had gone to one of the hotels to get a coffee from the hotel Starbucks, and there was some juvenile dance competition that was going on at the same time. So the hotel lobby was just completely filled with dance moms and dance kids. And the one thing that I found really jarring is that a lot of them were wearing attire that I would say is skimpy. And I don't just mean tight clothing, because I know when you're doing dance or gymnastics or anything like that, you wear something that's that's form-fitting or alleged. I don't know. I don't even know the terminology. That's how little I know about that world. But I, I'm talking about, you know, exposing midriff, really, really short, short, short for people that are, I don't know, what, eight, nine, ten years old. And I had said something about this later that day on my show. 
And then I got backlash from people, including a few dance moms, saying that by even being weirded out by it, I was being creepy. That, that by saying you have an issue with it, it means that you're looking at something in a sexual way and that makes you the problem. And I, I don't buy into that because it does seem like there is something overtly sexual about the way that the girls in this movie are being marketed. And it's not just this critical satire or social commentary, but there's something in how Netflix has marketed the movie that shows they want to exploit that sexualization. And that's the big problem here, is that by sexualizing for the purposes of marketing, even if you can say, and I don't buy into it, but even if you can say that Netflix has misrepresented what it's all about, the fact that they think that's what their audience wants, the fact that the people around their marketing table think, okay, this is the greatest selling point of this. And that's where, irrespective of the intention of the filmmaker, which I, I don't know and I won't even pretend to know, that's where the big problem is, that Netflix is putting this out, promoting it in this way. That's what they think it's all about. I mean, look at Little Miss Sunshine, for example. Little Miss Sunshine was a great movie. It kind of mocked that, you know, child dance world. It didn't do it in a sexualizing way. So there's something very distinct in cuties, and even in the name, there's a problem. There's something very distinct in cuties from what a lot of the defenders of this are trying to portray. And that's where a lot of the outrage is not just this, you know, <laughs> Helen Lovejoy. Is it Helen Lovejoy in The Simpsons that says, won't someone please think of the children? It's not that, or is it Maude Flanders? I don't, I don't even know. I, I know the clip. I don't know The Simpsons, I'll admit. But there's something very disingenuous about what's happening right now in the media to try to downplay all of the concerns and say, oh, it's just like, you know, I saw someone liken this to Pizzagate, for example. If you uh, have concerns about the way children are being sexualized by Netflix, that is apparently no different than thinking there's a, a pedophile ring being run out of a pizza shop on Connecticut Ave. So this has now been put in the culture war, which is, I think, a very important place for it to be. But if you come against it, you're now the problem. And, and this is just the level of gaslighting that's going Going on that needs to be rejected and needs to be repelled by people. So, you know, watch it, don't watch it, cancel your Netflix subscription, don't cancel your Netflix subscription. I really don't care. But what I do care about is that no one should be allowed to be told that you are not allowed to be frustrated or even offended by something that it seems like is designed to do that. And, and that's where he gets to the other part of me. And perhaps this is a bit cynical, but Netflix just wanting to wade into this controversy. So to certain people, it can look all progressive and hip. And, you know, to other people, it, uh, it doesn't really matter because those people might not have been Netflix subscribers anyway. What was interesting is that the Netflix CEO was on CNN. And I, I saw this in a piece on Summit News. And despite this interview at the middle of this scandal, the middle of this cutie scandal, not a single question about it. Not a single question. So this was an interview with a Netflix co-CEO. I don't know how you have a co-CEO. It's a, you know, basically so no one has to take responsibility. But co-CEO Reed Hastings was on CNN Newsroom anchor uh, Poppy Har Harlow's interview. And they had questions that were basically just about the new corporate structure of Netflix. So uh, the middle of a scandal and he's being asked about, you know, where the blinds are going to go and which office he's taking. And, and that's it. Oh, yes. And diverse programming. Because that's the whole point now. I mean, right now, the diversity cult has prioritized diversity and wokeness over anything else. So you can actually normalize child abuse and you can normalize the sexualization of children. Uh, but as long as you have a multiracial, multiethnic cast, you know, the only way that the left would oppose cuties is if it had an all-white cast. That's the only thing that would get people annoyed by this. And if you don't believe me, just look at the new guidelines for the Academy Awards Best Picture. These are, uh, <laughs> these are the death of the arts because what's happened here is in order to qualify for Best Picture, you have to meet a certain set of criteria that are not based on the quality of the film, but that are based on whether the film was inclusive 
or not. This is not a joke. This is not parody. This is the Oscars, the gold standard of recognizing art and recognizing film. And now it's all about diversity. It's all about wokeness. So no longer is it just the speeches that are woke and the speeches that are obnoxious, but even the criteria for nomination. And let me explain some of this, because what has happened here is there are a number of criteria that have been put out, and in order for something to be nominated for Best Picture, you have to meet two of these four so-called inclusion criteria. So there are four representation categories, on screen, among the crew, at the studio, and opportunities for training and advancement in other aspects of the film's development and release, whatever that means. You have to meet two of the four standards, and within each category, there are substandards. So for example, you have to have a lead or significant supporting character from an underrepresented racial or ethnic group, or at least 30% of secondary roles from two underrepresented, gr uh, underrepresented groups, or a main storyline that focuses on an underrepresented group. And that means uh, women, people of color, LGBTQ people, or people with disabilities. And this is for Best Picture. So again, this is for the apex, the acme of the Academy Awards. And if you make it uh, and have a white cast and your secondary cast is not 30% minority and your plot is not about social justice, you might not be able to have an actual go at the Oscars. And look, I mean, the reality is a lot of movies are doing this anyway because there's a market for this sort of content. There's a market for leads that are not just, you know, white males like James Bond. There's a market, sure, it's the idea of forcing this and saying that recognition, which is supposed to be about the quality of the art, now has to be about all of these other things. And a lot of actors are heralding it because they want to look all woke and, and justice-y. Uh, Kirstie Alley, who admittedly I, I don't think is a, an invitee at the Oscars normally, she says it's a disgrace because she doesn't buy into this whole long-lasting change narrative. She's saying, uh, and I think this is very good, she said, imagine telling Picasso what had to be in his effing paintings. You people have lost your mind. Control artists, control individual thought. Oscar Orwell. Now, she ended up deleting this because uh, every now and then when a celebrity says something smart, all their celebrity friends uh, jump on them and they, they have to back away. You know, remember when Ricky Gervais uh, just absolutely slayed at, I think it was the Golden Globes last year? I would love to see him at the Oscars right now, the year that they put this nonsense into effect. And, and you know, it's good because the Oscars have been declining in relevance. This is probably going to be the final nail in the coffin or pretty darn close to it. But just contrasting this with cuties, these are the things that the entertainment sector is choosing to prioritize. And just think of that very carefully. When we return, more of The Andrew Lawton Show here on True North. You're tuned in to The Andrew Lawton Show. So right now, I take a fair bit of pride in being an unlicensed broadcaster, an unlicensed podcaster, an unlicensed commentary on the unlicensed True North. And this is something that, again, will make us like the new sort of pirate radio stations of 2020 if Stephen Gilbo the federal heritage minister gets his way. Once again, he is talking about licensing and regulating private media companies. This guy, it's like his go-to trick. When he doesn't have anything else to say, he goes back to licensing. Sometimes he walks it back later. A lot of the times he doesn't. But here is a clip of Stephen Gilbo talking about this on Global News. Minister, I do want to ask you as well about Facebook, Twitter, some of these internet giants that are here in Canada. Um, there's been a lot of discussion in including in your cabinet, of whether these platforms are taking responsibility for some of the content that's being posted there and calls to do more to regulate that. Also concerns about free speech. What's your approach in terms of getting these big internet giants that are not based in Canada to take responsibility for things that are put up that either incite violence uh, or hate speech or in some cases are basically just massive social media gang ups? Well, we have made a commitment to, 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 to fight on uh, online hate, um, uh, child pornography, uh, and, 
and really an incitement to, to, to terrorism. And, and we are seeing a lot of that online. And, and we are we all are so seeing that these platforms can't regulate themselves. It's, it's We've tried that and, and it's simply not working. Now, there's a big difference between saying that we're going to, to, to regulate the, these, the, these hateful things and these appalling things, and we're going to put an end to free speech on the internet. That's, that's really not what, what this is about. Just like we have free speech in our society, but people can't say everything. They, you, you can't verbally abuse someone. Uh, we have courts that have put put measures uh, around f- free speech. Well, we're doing it in, in the real world. World, we can do it on um, on, on the virtual world uh, as well. And and this is something that myself, my my colleague Minister Baines, uh, obviously Justice Minister uh, Lametti, uh, uh, are working on, and we will be coming up with legislation um, uh, in the very near future. What about regulation of some of these internet giants as well that are providing content and news and entertainment? And I think of Netflix um, or perhaps Apple News, uh, uh, Amazon, a number of platforms that are effectively now competing with Canadian media organizations, but they're not regulated in the same way that Canadian broadcasters and media are. Is your government looking at either deregulating some of what you're putting onto broadcasters or putting stricter regulations and requirements on some of these companies? Well, there's really two things. On, on the one hand, there's uh, investment in, in Canadian cultural content, uh, just like we're asking uh, Global or, or, or CTV or, or CBC uh, or Bell Media to, to, to invest in Canadian cultural content. Uh, we're going to ask uh, the same of web, of web giants, the, the, the Netflix of this world, uh, Apple Music, Spotify, Amazon Prime. We're going to we're going to put put some fairness into in the into the Canadian regulatory system because right now there is no fairness. We we have Canadian companies that have regulatory obligations uh, and we have international web giants that have none. And and, and it, that's that's unsustainable. So we, and I have said that I, I I would be tabling a bill. I was hoping to do it by June. Obviously COVID um, delayed this, but uh, uh, when the house comes comes back, I will have a bill to table in the house uh, looking specifically at uh, Canadian culture content. Okay, I know that's a long clip, but there's a lot in there. I mean, he goes through all of the greatest hits talking about hate speech and extremist speech and the need to bolster Canadian content and sharing news content and all of these things. And it's a very dangerous position. And the reason is that the Heritage Minister, and I said this in an interview on Ezra Levant's show a couple of days ago, the Heritage Minister used to be about, you know, grants for this Canadian art project and that Canadian art project. But now it's a lot more than that. I mean, now it's like the chief censor role in Canada. And and when big tech is becoming such a a huge force, now regulation has become such a huge priority. And whatever you think of Facebook or Twitter or Google or Spotify or any of these other tech giants, know that government regulation, especially this liberal government in Canada, is never going to make any of these things better. It can only serve to make them worse. So when he's saying we don't trust them to regulate themselves, he's saying the government needs to start cracking down to purge so-called hate speech from social media platforms, even though there already is a legal mechanism, there's already criminal hate speech. If something is illegal offline, it's also illegal online. But he's trying to gaslight people. Stephen Gilbo is trying to say that there's this big gap in the law where if you do something on the internet, you get immunity. It's like, you know, diplomatic immunity, except for social media. So you can't be prosecuted for anything you say online when anything that is illegal in the real world is also, to use his words, illegal in the virtual world. And this whole thing about, you know, forcing uh, social media companies to pay for news content being shared. I mean, this is just him trying to buy the support from the media. He's trying to buy the support from the mainstream media by saying, hey, you know, what we're trying to do is get these uh, big tech companies to start writing you guys checks to supplement the checks that the government itself wrote you in that $600 million bailout fund. And all of this is just a desire to license, to regulate, but it means the government wants to control the internet. So at the beginning of this segment, when I kind of joked about being an unlicensed, unregulated uh, broadcaster, podcaster, columnist, I mean, that's not really much of a joke. He's already talked about wanting to license specifically, that's his word, wanting to license publishers in the past. And when there was a lot of backlash, he had said, oh, no, 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 well, you know, we're not going to make news outlets license. Well, he hasn't defined what a news outlet is. 
And we already know that the government doesn't view us as proper media. They don't view us as a news outlet. So will they force us to get a license? What about any other companies? It's not just about Facebook and Google. It's about anyone who has an online presence even if it is just on social media platforms. And the reason for that is that if the government starts threatening social media companies with fines or prosecution, if they don't take down speech, that means that government will have deputized Facebook to be its enforcer on so-called hate speech, which means that you're getting censored. It's the illusion that it's coming from a private company but it's actually government. And this is all part and parcel of the plan that is supposedly to protect Canadian heritage interests. We've got to wrap things up there. We'll be back in a few days on Monday with another edition of Canada's most irreverent talk show. You're listening to The Andrew Lawton Show on True North. Thank you, God bless, and good day, Canada. Thanks for listening to The Andrew Lawton Show. Support the program by donating to True North at www.tnc.news.